OK, uh, so welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Nate Ani. I'm with AppAssembler. Um, and I'm very happy to have assembled a stellar panel for our uh, discussion today. Um, these are some of the leaders in the open edX community who are doing really in innovative things um, at their companies. And as many of you know, um, open edX in the corporate space is a relatively new thing, right? edX came out of academia. And now there's a lot of companies that are starting to adopt open edX. Um, so from my experience uh, as a systems integrator, as an open edX solutions provider, there, there's a significant gap between what open edX provides today and what the needs of the corporation are. And we're going to learn today from our panelists what some of those needs are. <laughs> um, so with further ado, I'm going to introduce very briefly just throw up a slide so you know who all these people are, and then we're going to go down the line uh, three minutes each. OK, three minutes each. <laughs> we want to allow time for questions. And I just want to, I'll mention this now and at the end, we're also going to have a boff, a birds of a feather, um, this afternoon where we can continue the discussion, uh, more of an informal, not a lecture style, but we can all hang out and, and talk about these things more. So uh, with that, I want to kick it off with Carolyn from Microsoft. Thank you, Nate. So I'm Carolyn Lesser. I'm the Director of Engineering for the Microsoft Learning Experiences team. I would say that we're relatively new to open edX, although not new to edX. We have a number of courses uh, today on edX.org that really target developers uh, and data professionals. Uh, for open edX, we started with uh, piloting uh, an internal MOOC uh, with the goal of being able to serve the needs of our customers, our partners, and our employees, uh, notably trying to avoid creating content for multiple parties, but being able to create one set of content that serves them all. Uh, one of the interesting challenges that we have with technology and training is the cloud cadence that we're in today. And so that's one of the reasons that Open edX was very appealing, because we need to be able to make updates as rapidly as Azure is no 365 are adding features, and they're releasing pretty frequently now, not the every three-year cadence that we typically had with operating systems. Uh, additionally for us, um, we need to be able to connect it to our own reporting uh, within the enterprise. Uh, we need to be able to support hands-on learning with labs, so LTI became sort of a big uh, investment for us. And we wanted to have sort of the rigor uh, of our certification or our training elements within our MOOC as well, as far as assessments and uh, the labs that uh, we provide. And then, of course, finally, we wanted to be able to operationalize our instance on Azure and offer the choice of cloud provider for anyone that was choosing Open edX as their solution. Hi, I'm Rowan. I'm here from Cloudera On Demand. Uh, we are very new to using uh, Open edX. We kind of soft launched in December, and we really are just kind of getting up to a, a full slate of courses. Like, uh, well, I'll be working on it again next week <laughs> when I'm back from this conference. Um, and uh, you know, we had the traditional the need that that lots of corporations have now of taking our model of in-person training with our excellent instructors, but you can only do you know. 10 to 20 people at a time and scaling that up. You know, we have customers who have hundreds of people who need training and they're not going to put them through an ILT class 10, 10 people at a time. Um, and then on the other side, we have some fairly technical courses that uh, people were frustrated they weren't running often enough in their geographical area. You know, there's, well, there's only like three people who want to take the HBase course in Asia right now, so we're not running it. Um, so now, you know, they're happy they, they can get them uh, online. Um, and uh, something we would like to do with the platform, which is uh, sort of contrary to how the platform is designed right now, is we really want to be offering a time-based subscription to our offerings. So, you know, our courses run indefinitely until we come out with a new release of the course, uh, and you buy three months, six months, 12 months of access to that, rather than you know, the edX model, which is uh, you know, a course starts on this date and runs for these four months with this group of people, and then it ends and, and it's done. So it's, it's a very different model of kind of you know, rolling um, enrollments um, 
and that's you know one of the challenges we're facing because the architecture really is is not designed around that concept at all. Um, and yeah, my final bullet point here it was sort of um, my my current number one wish, uh, and this sort of goes with a general uh, point, um, which is. Uh, a lot of what I see right now that the edX community is doing is reinventing some wheels that already exist out there. Reporting, huge, huge requirement that I think a lot of this have. There are amazing reporting applications already out there, right? Um, I don't think anything that edX can build is ever gonna rival Tableau or Click or, or Spotfire um, because obviously that's, that's not the business that edX is in. They're not in the business of building a reporting application and I don't think they should be. So give us, um, give us a data store <laughs> that is documented and that we can hook our reporting application up to. Um, or give us a data plugin so that we can do uh, content management and content publishing from um, Dita, if you haven't heard of it, is an, is an open source spec for um, content reuse and content versioning and it's fantastic and it's already very mature and out there. We just want a plugin so that we can publish into edX from a, from a data content management system, you know. So that's my, that's my pitch. Um, so I'm Doug Foster from Inner Systems uh, and I don't have eyes in the back of my head so <laughs> I'm not going to be able to go over this and there's no way, don't, don't worry, there's no way I can even see that. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, you know, even these glasses are good for about here. Um, so uh, we are a database technology company. So uh, really my focus is training our customers and partners. Um, so our online models, we, we give all the training away for free because if my implementation partners can implement systems faster, we get our licensing dollars. Uh, so that's, and that's, you know, a hundred times to a thousand times factor of anything I could get away of charging for my courses. So, so that's really our model, help them be successful. Um, because of that, our, our classroom training traditionally had been big and monolithic, come in for 40 hours, 80 hours of training. Um, we have big pushback from our developers on that, and really they want more task-focused, problem-focused content. Uh, so we're looking at how do we develop uh, learning paths or programs that are focused on specific roles. Um, you know, we, we're implementing a learning stack, so we're using LTI and SSO and using Totora, which is a Moodle-based LMS to, to drive some of that and connect into edX. Um, other things that we're doing, so again, we're, we're software, so to provide people with a live lab, uh, we're using Docker containers, uh, so people can launch our product in the cloud. They don't have to have it installed locally. Uh, and also from a, a training point of view, we can preload code or data, so if we're teaching them to run certain SQL queries or JSON documents, we can have it preloaded with known data that when we do a quiz, we can have them do something in the environment and the quiz answers what, what result they get. If they do it right, we can test that. Um, so I think those are, are most of the big things. Uh, <laughs> you know, learning paths, cloud-based containers, yeah, SSO and, and LTI. Uh, we do microsites as well because, again, we have certain customers with very specific needs. Um, so we've done a microsite with custom content for them. You don't get your... <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Luis. I'm a software engineer at IBM, and I'm also the technical lead at Big Data University, uh, which is an initiative by IBM to provide free training and free learning on big data and data science uh, and all this cool stuff. Uh, we've, we've been out for a couple of years. I think so, the launch in 2010 around that. And uh, our, let's call it business model, I wouldn't call it business model, but our business model would be similar to what uh, Douglas represented, it's like the idea is uh, people will not use your technology if they don't know how to. They will not, you know, IBM has a bunch of products. People don't go say, oh, I think I'm going to use DB2 on my next startup because, you know, it's IBM, but they don't do that. Uh, so the idea is if we train the people, if we provide them with the skills and the knowledge, then they'll come and learn. Uh, you know, they come back and buy our products. Uh, but 
we don't want to, we don't advertise ourselves as IBM because we don't teach IBM stuff. We teach uh, technology instead of products. So we don't teach you IBM Big Insight. We teach you Hadoop. Uh, and I think that's the main difference between the traditional IBM training. Uh, we don't we don't focus on specific tools. Uh, of course, in our labs, we do use uh, the IBM products because it's just simpler for us. And it's also, you know, we're not a NGO. We want to <laughs> make money at the end. So. Uh, but we don't enforce it. It's not like you can take your uh, any Hadoop deployment that you have uh, to take your labs. Uh, in terms of corporate learning, uh, we've been starting out uh, talking with some companies to provide uh, training to their employees. Uh, the main motivation is that it's a quote that I saw online. I don't remember the source. I'm sorry, but if you might say is the the CFO goes to CEO and say. What happens if you train our employees and they leave? And the CEO replies, what happens if you don't train and they stay? <laughs> so, you know, like there, there's no point having employees if they're not skilled, if they don't have the knowledge. And we've been finding that people, they want to get the knowledge, they want to get better. Uh, and if your company don't provide, they just go outside and find any source they, they can to get the, the skill. Uh, and our idea is that with Big Data University, we can provide them with a uniform knowledge, you know, we can provide this. They, they all take the same course, they gather the same skill, and we wanted to make customizable for each uh, company because they have different businesses, they are interested in different topics. Uh, so we do provide, we call private portals where they can sort of pick and choose what courses they want from our catalog, uh, create what we call their learning path, so they can define which courses the employees should take and which order, uh, and they can provide that to their uh, employees. Uh, in terms of technical challenges we're having, uh, one of them is to kind of adapt to different environments that is out of our, out of our control. So they have, enterprises have firewalls, they have their own, some of them are afraid of the cloud thing and they wanna do on-prem. So that's one of the challenges uh, we're having to deal with. Others are customization, so how can we put their brands on their portals and stuff like that. Uh, we're just starting out but uh, we're having some good progress so far. Sorry, I'm just gonna stand if you don't mind. <laughs> I just noticed one thing. We have three people with formal pants and then three with denim. <laughs> <laughs> Corporate culture changes. Um, anyway, um, I am Vishal Gandhi. I'm the head of product engineering at McKinsey Academy. Um, we are one of the early adopters of Open edX. It's been about like two and a half years or three uh, around that time. Um, so you, some of them, some, some of you might have seen our custom front end. Um, it's pretty customized. And in case you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me after this. Um, but basically, we offer management and leadership capability building courses. Um, we have a lot of folks from within McKinsey who are. Um, designing these courses. Um, I'm on the engineering side of things and product. Um, uh, it's a bit business to business model. Um, we have about uh, 50, 50 to 200 participants in each cohort. Um, our primarily targeted audience is mid-level to senior ex uh, managers and executives. Um, so I guess from our side, you know, our platform unique features, uh, we have this uh, notion of group-based projects where uh, we put people into groups and they're assigned a project and there's a little, little bit of peer grading that we do and we also do our own uh, grading. Um, we also have some really cool like social learning tools uh, like leaderboards and uh, private and cohort-wide discussion boards. Um, we have TA guidance, which is pretty cool. Uh, one of our TAs is right here. Um, analytics is another big thing for McKinsey, obviously, and. Uh, we provide uh, users with proficiency, progress, and social engagement through the course. Um, and we also have a company dashboard portal um, so that HR and other clients from other companies can track progress of their employers and how they're doing the course. Um, so in terms of what we're trying to achieve in the next year, I think um, one thing is there, I mean, you guys have already mentioned quite a few things and this is so much in common, it's crazy. but. Um, I think one thing is just uh, better reporting, a uh, much more uh, elaborate like data source that we can use and plug in into our reporting mechanisms like Tableau or whatever you guys use. Um, the other thing is uh, we started thinking beyond just the course.
like outside the course and it's kind of like a learning path for the user. So we started like coming up with some concepts. So thinking about courses and programs actually, you know, outside the course, like bundling program uh, courses into programs, how we can combine um, that sort of uh, uh, journey for the user so that they understand that they're in a program and then they can go through XYZ journey or ABC journey based on their interests. So those kind of things are of interest to us. Um, and then lastly, there's uh, SCORM. Uh, we're interested in SCORM and LTI, whatever you guys have been, you know, <laughs> whatever challenges you guys have been facing, I think we're facing the same. So we'd like to discuss that more. Thanks. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank Nate for inviting me to this corporate panel. Um, my name is Juan Manuel Sarabi. I'm the founder and CEO of a small tech company in Colombia, South America. Um, it's very nice to be here at Stanford and, and share with you my experience with OpenEDX. Uh, one of the services we provide in Colombia is an, an uh, OpenEDX-based e-learning platform service. Um, we do this for the CPG industry, for the consumer packed goods industry, which is pretty much Clorox, Procter & Gamble, uh, PepsiCo, etc. Designed this this uh, service in order to centralize and to be uh, able to create a, an affordable and efficient way uh, to train the the support staff these these companies have on on on, on the ground. Um, so far, we have three thousand users uh, or regular monthly users uh, with four major clients, which are uh, Procter and Gamble, Pfizer, Vision Marketing, and Arnera Al Valle. Um, we started almost uh, like a year ago, and three months later, uh, Procter & Gamble was in love with our service. This is an end-to-end -end service, uh, which includes the, the instructional design of all the contents, uh, the design of all the multimedia resources, uh, the constant uh, analytics uh, monitoring, and a very personalized follow-up of the users, which is our very uh, interesting uh, differentiator which is uh, following the track of the students. Um, our unique uh, features is uh, we have evolved uh, understanding this client's needs. Um, and we have understand, we understood that, that, that these clients need a very, very cheap way to, to train all these people. Uh, for example, in Colombia, Procter & Gamble has almost 800, 900 people on the ground that they need to train. Um, one of our, our um, main uh, challenges was to change the view of these companies. They are very traditional clients and uh, selling to them the idea that this e-learning platform was going to change or, or to the replace a uh, face-to-face -face training was very difficult. Uh, and I think this is going to, to be uh, all over the region to sell this idea is not going to be easy. Um, but I think we have achieved or we have a, a very, very interesting experience. Um, I think that's it. Great, okay, so thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their, their experience. Uh, now I wanna open it up to some questions, uh, and I have so many questions for you guys. Um, <laughs> but I also wanna open it up to the audience, but first, uh, just to kind of kick things off, um, I think Louise, you said that people don't use the products if they don't know how to use them. And that was also echoed by Doug. And can you talk a little bit about how the, 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 the transition from the, the traditional in-person classroom training to this online and, and how that's changing your business? Um, I, I think the, the big thing for us, uh, sending a developer in for 40 or 80 hours worth of training is a, a big commitment. So you, you generally would do that if you had a big project. Uh, and one of the areas where, where we're struggling, so uh, our, our technology has been around for 37 years. We have customers that are, we've had for 37 years. So that's great, uh, except that uh, some of our programmers are very used to doing it the old way um, and don't know how to spell Jason or REST. <laughs> um, but what happens is they're hiring new developers and the new developers come in to develop a web UI and say, hey, I'm gonna use, you know, I wanna use Angular, and hey, we, let's just do a mean stack. And they throw Mongo in and all of this. Well, 
we, we do documents. You, you don't need to support a whole new database. You, you could use our technology, but you're using the newer version. So what online allows us to do is educate them on some of the newer tools, and we actually design our, our courses and the learning paths to start with just some awareness training where we'll roll out, here's our new document data model, and here's how to use it if you already have this back end, or here's how to use it if you're a JavaScript person, and try to teach them the new model, which I can do starting with a 10 minute module to get them interested because they won't commit even to a one hour course. So, so that's, you know, I, I've got to start with a 10 minute module, which people have told me is still three minutes too long, <laughs> right? So we, it, I think that's the big thing that online allows us to do from a business model is get people interested in the technology and teach them enough. And again, with the online lab, we get them interested and we say, hey, click here. And then in 30 minutes, we can teach them the API, but not just, we don't teach them the whole API. We teach them enough to, hey, create a document. Boom. Hey, search a document. Hey, look, you, you could also run SQL against that document. Not, they don't, at the end of the 30 minutes, they don't know, they, they couldn't code in our tool but they're interested enough that our goal is to then either get them to buy or be convinced that they don't need to bring in another <clears throat> tool. So I think that's something that we, we, we couldn't do that in the classroom and online, you know, it's, it's yeah. easy for us to kind of step people through that progression. Great. Any other panelists want to add to that? So yeah, I, I agree with the response. It's, uh, we, when you took, like, I'm going to talk about IBM because that's the, the company I work for, but when you take an IBM course, it's like you pay thousands of dollars and you go to the course and they teach you how to get the tool, how to install, how to fine tune it, and how eventually how to use it. But these steps are done by different people. Like, not everybody cares about all of that. They, some people they just don't want to use it. Some people just want to manage it. Uh, so if online learning allows you to kind of break down and, like, people can choose whatever they're interested in. Uh, and so that's uh, one of the greatest advantage uh, that we have. Uh, another thing uh, that Doug mentioned, and I agree, is that inside the corporation, the power is kind of changing. Uh, like most of the tech budget was, used to be the IT department that would like pretty much define what technology the company will use. But nowadays, going more to like marketing and other uh, departments that they're hiring like this. 20 something year old people out of college that it's very dig into open source, you know, all these kind of tools. They don't want to use IBM products. They want to use whatever they're familiar with. Uh, and now they're getting the power to kind of choose those things. Uh, so one of the challenges we're facing is that we want to show them like, uh, you know, you can also use IBM products for free. We don't have to uh, kind of break the mind share, uh, the mindset that people have. Uh, of this IBM. So I think the, uh, the online platform allows us to do that, to spread our message uh, to a much broader audience that is used to open source and free product and stuff like that. So both Doug from InterSystems and Louise um, talked about virtual labs. Talk to us about what, how that helps the learning process for, for your users. What, what do they gain by having a virtual lab? So the learning process is kind of divided in two phases, right? One is when you absorb, absorb the content. So you uh, watch the video, read the materials, uh, but you only really get, you know, you don't have the spark moment where you say, okay, I got this, when you actually put in practice. When you're reading, when you're watching stuff, you kind of say, okay, makes sense. And everything, 10 seconds later, you forget everything. Uh, so when you put this stuff in practice, when you're challenged to actually do it yourself, I think that's when all the knowledge kind of gets stuck in your brain. And uh, being able to spin up a virtual lab in a second instead of having to download the tool, install it on your machine, and by then you forgot what you watched, and then you're going, okay, let's watch it again, and you don't have time for that. So uh, this agility to actually uh, bring up a, a sandbox where you can practice your, your learning, I think is very valuable. Yeah. I. I'll add on to that with kind of two things. Uh, one, we're teaching developers that 
uh, don't always follow instructions. So, you know, we teach them, oh, create, create a document, uh, add apples, add oranges, add bananas. Now, even for me, when I'm learning, I'm like, ooh, hey, can I add zebras and dogs? <laughs> right? So what, because you, you change the model, and, but that's, that's how you learn as a developer is you don't, you don't just follow the rope piece, you, you want to play with it a bit. Uh, so the environment allows them to do that. Um, the other thing, as I'd said before, for, for a lot of our stuff, because it's database and a lot of queries, we can preload, it, rather than them downloading and installing, we, we have an environment that's preloaded with specific data so that we can give them a much more rich uh, you know, searching capability. We can load messages that are over time. In some of our training, we load messages that have errors so that when they run a certain query, they can get an error and we want to teach them how do they debug that error and go find that. And, and those are things that aren't even easy in, you know, we can do some of it in the classroom using big virtual machines, but I, I can do it really easily on that line uh, in the lab. So, and that's an, ex again, I think that's the, the real teaching moment is mm -hmm giving them data that has an error, issues, or things they need to search through is much more realistic. I can make it realistic for them rather than just they add apple, they add banana. You know, they, they can search the entire US zip code database. They can mm -hmm. combine that with some other data that they get off the web directly. Um, you know, so we can do some really neat things for them um, because of that live environment. We have a very similar experience. I mean, uh, we have to teach at a very different level. I mean, what you guys teach is very complicated for me. <laughs> we have to teach people how to organize the products at the point of sale. And pretty much what we have done and we have achieved uh, in, a very, very, um, uh, in a very good way is uh, we have created uh, exercises or small labs where they have to play with the product and put it in the right place. And I, I think that's really the best way to teach someone how to do their job. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a very complicated task or a very basic task like organizing the product in, in, uh, at the point of sale. But really when you get them to, to interact or to play with the tool, they're really learning. And I, I believe that's, uh, that's something that EDX should work a bit more on, on how to create those uh, exercises on, or, or make it simpler for us to create those, those kind of exercises. So I heard, I heard at least three of you talk about learning paths. So <laughs> what, what do learning paths mean to you? How are, why are they important? Uh, so the learning paths are important for us because we are dealing with companies and different businesses, companies with different goals. And what the learning paths allow is them is to actually customize uh, what their employees is gonna learn, how they're gonna learn, how they go through this learning process. Uh, so it's more, much more about guiding people uh, over a whole catalog, of course, because if you just present them with a catalog, then they kind of get lost, and if they, sp if they have to think for, for more than 30 seconds, they're just gonna give up. Uh, so the learning path really allows a starting point and then goes through uh, that. Uh, we're actually working on making it even more granular than learning paths, go to allowing uh, companies to actually pick up videos and exercises and cre cre create their courses very customizable way. But we're starting with this high level course uh, learning path and uh, it really helps people. Yeah, so um, for McKinsey Academy so far, um, in terms of courses, you know, it's just a very linear path um, where you, know, you go from lesson one to lesson 10. But I think for us, the learning path is, it comes from a bunch of use cases that we're trying to solve for our clients. Um, I think one thing is um, clients come to us and ask us about possibility of pointing some of their internal courses on our, on our domain, on our, on our site. Um, the other one is uh, clients ask us if, if they're able to like jump through different courses and not provide like, not, not have a very linear sort of uh, course structure. Um, and lastly, it's just, uh, you know, also 
uh, we, we also want to show our, our participants some articles or, or content that's not really part of McKinsey Academy, but might just be like something from you know uh, a journal or, or some other external content. So um, putting all that together um, in, 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 in a more like uh, uh, structured fashion um, is, is what our learning path, uh, you know, what, what we're thinking about learning path. And lastly, um, we also have some initiatives around um, in-person sessions. So it's kind of like blended learning, but being able to, you know, provide a participant a clear direction about like, okay, you know, your, your first in-person session is, is probably at, at this location, and then you have to take this digital course, and then you have to maybe look at your internal course, and then you may have to look at this external article. So like putting that all together um, and providing a clear learning path is, is what we're looking for. Well, for us, uh, the learning path is crucial because we align the strategic objectives of Procter & Gamble with the training we're giving the, the, the people. So uh, it's pretty much like an enforced learning path month to month, uh, which is it's kind of hard to keep up for the students because they need to know about Pantene, they need to know about Head & Shoulders, they need to know about Oral-B. And we launched the, the modules or the courses right in the month uh, where, it m it, where it hurts the most Procter & Gamble. For example, in July, they learn uh, X or Y uh, product. So uh, it is very important for us to keep track of, of, of this learning path from our students. Okay, so I have one more question for you, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, if there's one thing you could change about Open edX, what would it be? And I want to hear from all of you, just down the line. Carolyn? <laughs> <laughs> if we would organize this, we could all just... <laughs> Well, I think the one that's come up pretty frequently is um, the access to the data and basically um, providing an easy means for us to pull that data to do uh, the reporting and analytics. I think that's sort of been the foundational piece that we've been really looking at. Uh, well, I'll second Carolyn's. Um, uh, I will say uh, incremental updates. Um, the, the rate that information you know about Hadoop and Cloudera changes is is astronomical right you're talking about you know we used to have three years to <laughs> update the courses now it's like oh well that was uh, that was in date last week and out of date this week um, so we urgently need an easy way to incrementally update a course um, probably from from an external tool um, and you can import and export an entire course but there's as I understand it, no way to just kind of reach in and be like, okay, this needs updating, this one unit here. Uh, so yes, in incremental updates is, is my one wish. Uh, man, I can't do one wish. <laughs> <laughs> Save it for the boff. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll pick video. So, and, and I know this has come up in another one, so uh, I can't put my videos out on YouTube. I mean, I could put some of them out on YouTube, so we use Brightcove, uh, and but what I need to do to wedge it into the player, the, the great thing, so Open edX, everybody loves the video player, and hey, I can change the speed, and I've got interactive transcripts and all of that. Um, but I, if I used Brightcove's player, I get uh, either the security that I need, I get uh, variable bit rate that actually can adjust. So, you know, if your bandwidth goes down, it starts sending you a different stream. So I, I need to be able to integrate those two, right? So, and I know we, we had a little bit of a discussion in one of the, the birds of a feather yesterday about that, but I, I need some way to, to do that so I can control my videos, who has access to it, um, and then be, but be able to leverage the player uh, for what it does. Because that's, uh, we, we've had to update just our video portal to try to mimic uh, the open edX video player because everybody loved it so much and they all yelled, it's like, how come I can't speed up the video over here, but I can do it in open edX? I've got 843 videos on that video player. I can't convert them all into a course just for that. Um, so, but it, people love it. So I've, I've got to be able to somehow combine the two. Uh, yeah, it's hard to pick one thing as the main one. Uh, not that there are many problems, but there. Uh, I think, uh, especially for the the private portals that I mentioned that we're working on, uh, 
the create more APIs. Uh, I think be one of the things that we need uh, be able to access through not using the traditional uh, OpenEdX UI, but be able to create something on top of that and just get the content uh, through API, not just for analytics, but also for uh, creating a different uh, way to kind of display the content to the, uh, to the users. Um, I'm gonna go with Microsoft Cloud Era. Same thing, reporting. Um, I think it's been one thing that you know we we would like to see a little, a little more better, um, well structured uh, model for us to create our reports. Um, I'm just gonna say one more thing though, because <laughs> you said reporting. But um, I think one. This is like a like a half request, more more than a full. But um, I think one thing about authoring, which is a logistic nightmare for us, is um, you know the studio interface, at some places there's a lot of HTML sort of uh, interfaces, and it's difficult for our um, authors to like understand HTML and then you know write content. So it would be, it would be nice if you know at some point there's no HTML in the studio interface. Um, I would say something about gamification. Uh, my clients love our service. They definitely love what we do, but our, our users don't. I think we, we have to think more about the user. We have to think more how, how to engage the user because at the corporate level, it is an enforced training. I mean, they have to do it. Uh, so how can we make it more, more uh, I don't know, what's the word, but so that they fun. use more fun. <laughs> Probably more fun, so that the users really, really enjoy using the tool at a corporate level. Because when you're outside the, the, the corporate level, you enter EDX because you want to learn. At the corporate level, you enter because you have to learn, because they are they, they are asking you to do it. So I would say the the something about gamifications, points, rankings, something like that would be very interesting. Great. So there's a hackathon tomorrow and Friday. I think we can nail all these. <laughs> 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 All right, so Ike has a, Ike is raising his hand really high. Ike. Okay, uh, two points of talk uh, and then one question. Uh, at MIT, we're using GitHub and we can put content authoring and we can do incremental course changes easily. The other point of fact, uh, Harvard and MIT have a, a data connector. We load all of our uh, analytics data, tracking logs, SQL into BigQuery and into MySQL. And Stanford has a nice system where they load it into Postgres. We're all using Tableau a lot. And the question is, uh, what questions do you want to answer with Tableau if, we, if you all have the same system? Well, primarily for us, it's, um, you know, our corporate client comes to us and they buy 500 seats, you know, um, for people to go through a course or three courses. And then they need to know, did they? <laughs> <laughs> you know, did, yeah. did, did this guy in Hyderabad go through the course <laughs> um, uh, that they paid for? Uh, and, and so they, they, they want reporting just as a it's sort of, you know, so they can prod the person, hey, you know, we bought this for you, do it. Um, and uh, we also um, need to provide, prove the value to our customers because we're not providing our training for free of, you know, well, you bought a year subscription for 500 people and here's how much they used it. So that, those are the two halves of reporting, I think. I see we have a minute left, so. We have a little more time. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. I have a question. So if, when your company develop your training or modules or courses, do you have an internal designer being part of the team? If yes, what kind of qualifications do you require them to have? The question is, uh, do, you, do you employ an instructional designer as part of your team, and if so, what are their qualifications? Yeah, so, yes, uh, master's instructional design at least, uh, and multiple years of developing e-learning. Uh, my senior instructional design had uh, seven years of developing e-learning in the healthcare industry, which is one of our big uh, competitors, or, or our, our big focus areas. Um, and then I have another one that uh, has a certificate in instructional design, but, but years of education experience. And then our technical people are all developers that moved into education. Uh, so they typically were developers that at graduate school or something in computer science were, were a TA and got really interested in helping people learn how to program. So but again, they, they have to be, for some of our tools, they have to be a developer to teach. So we have 
that combination of a couple of instructional designers, a couple of course developers with an education bent, and then SMEs inside our company. Mark, <clears throat> Mark do we have time for uh, another question? No? Okay. I'm sorry we ran out of time, but uh, to remind you that we are having a BOF um, this afternoon, 2.45 to 3.15 in room 299, where we will continue the discussion. Can all of you guys be there? Okay, so all the panelists will be there at that time, and you can ask them the questions you didn't get to ask them in this room. Again, I want to thank all of our panelists. Thank you so much. Let's give them a big round of applause. All right. <laughs>